Welcome to LG Ministry. We're glad you have chosen to watch our program. My name is Coogan Collins, and I'm the minister at the Long Grove Church of Christ. Our hope and desire is that you will open up your Bible and study along with us. Be sure to check out all of our lessons on YouTube. Now let's get to our lesson. In this lesson, we'll be taking a look at what some call the Romance Book of the Bible. While the contents of this book may make some blush, it is tame compared to what we are exposed to in our society today. Of course, we're looking at the Song of Solomon. However, we learn from the early writers of Origen and uh, Jerome that the Jews forbade it from being read until a person was at least 30 years old. Indeed, this is an account of the intense love between a man and a woman who love each other, and it expresses their thoughts about each other and how they long for each other. It expresses the kind of love that every engaged and married couple should have for each other. The Hebrew name for the book is the Song of Songs, meaning that it is the best of all songs, presumably the best out of the thousand and five songs that Solomon wrote, 1 Kings 4, verse 32. This book is not quoted anywhere in the New Testament. There are three main divisions in this book. Number one, before the marriage. Number two, the marriage itself. And number three, after the marriage. Though this is a short book, only 117 verses, it has a large number of uncommon words. It contains 470 different Hebrew words, which is... Uh, unusually high for this size of a book. Of those words, 47 are unique to the book itself. 51 words occur in other parts of the Old Testament five times or less. 45 words occur between six and 10 times, and an additional 27 words occur between 11 and 20 times. This leaves about 300 common words in the Song of Solomon. What compounds this problem is that there are only 18 verses which include words that are all familiar to the Hebrew experts. Lloyd Carr notes this concerning this point. In other words, more than one-third of the words in the song occur so infrequently that there is little context from which accurate meanings can be deduced, and two-thirds of the verses of the song have uncommon words. Hence, many of the proposals made in the various translations and commentaries are at best educated guesses, particularly in the case of those words which are unique to the song, they may well be incorrect. This is why the Song of Solomon is considered to be one of the most difficult books for translators because they rely heavily on how a certain word is used in different areas. The less frequent they are used, the more difficult it becomes to render the Hebrew word with an English word that has the same meaning. While this is a love song, this is a poetic love song, and it is considered to be a superb Hebrew poetic composition by scholars. However, since this song has a sudden transition from speaker to speaker and from place to place without explaining when this happens, it makes it difficult to figure out who is talking and where they are at times. There is a way to tell when the speaker changes or when the place changes and that sort of thing. And the New King James Version, and I'm sure some of the other newer versions do this as well, but they make it easier for us to keep up with this because the translators have inserted who is speaking uh, and, and where the place is. So that way some of the confusion is taken away. Some of the speakers you will see in this song are the bride, sometimes called the beloved, or the Shulamite. The king also called her beloved. 
and a chorus of palace ladies called Daughters of Jerusalem, and there are a few other people that are referred to as well. Most scholars believe that Solomon is the author, though there are some critics that say otherwise. One thing that some find difficult to accept is how Solomon, who had 700 wives and 300 concubines, could have had such a love interest in one woman. While this might sound like a valid argument, there is a valid reason Solomon could have found this great love with one woman. The song itself teaches us that when Solomon had found this great love, that it was early on in his life. Because Song of Solomon 6, 8 says this, There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. While this is still a great number of wives and concubines, it was still a great deal away from a thousand he ended up with. We also have to keep in mind that many of these wives and concubines ended up with him because it had to do with political reasons. As he was expanding the kingdom and he would meet these other kings and these other places, they would a lot of times give their daughter to him. And so he would end up being married to all these different women because of political reasons. So it is certainly possible that Solomon could have found this one woman that he fell in love with and had this deep connection with. In Solomon's other writings, he certainly expressed the thought of having an intense love for your wife. Proverbs 5, verse 18, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 9, Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life, which he has given you under the sun. And we also have the evidence that is given that suggests that he wrote the song. The very first verse claims that he wrote it, Song of Solomon 1.1, 1, 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. The writer has an extensive knowledge and love for nature as used in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. The writer has an accurate knowledge of the different places in Israel, which a king would certainly know as well. There are a couple of references to the king, that the king was Solomon, such as chapter 1, verse 12, chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. For those of us who believe that Solomon is the author, the date of this writing would be around 960 B.C., but those who reject him as the author put it around 200 B.C. Some additional points about this book are as follows. This is the only book of the Bible entirely made up of speeches composed mostly of monologues with practically no dialogue. There is a continued appreciation of the beauties of nature. Vines, vineyards, gardens, and orchards are mentioned at least 20 times in the book. The name of God is never mentioned in the book. Since the book is unique in the Bible, people approach it in different ways. There are three main ways that some view this work. First, some view it as a drama. Origin around 250 AD was the first to suggest this particular view, and some commentators think that this might be the correct view. They basically look at the book as being a play that is to be sung or acted out. Generally, for a writing to be viewed as a drama, it must have the following elements. Number one, has a definite beginning, middle, and end. Number two, has logical progression to the story. Number three, clearly develops a theme and or characters. Number four, provides the technical information for the director, such as who is speaking and various stage directions. There are several weaknesses to this approach. Number one, the text of the Song of Solomon must be radically changed to fit the criteria of a drama. Carr wrote, considerable experience in theatrical productions and directions has persuaded me that the song as it now stands is unactable. It would be virtually impossible to stage effectively without major rewriting, and it lacks the dramatic impact to hold an audience. Number two, the style of drama is unknown to Hebrew literature. A second more popular way that people approach this book is that it is an allegory or an extended metaphor used to teach a deeper spiritual message. For example, the Jews read this book at the Passover and believe that it allegorically refers to the Exodus when God made Israel his bride. After all, the Old Testament does call, call Israel 
God's wife, Jeremiah 3, verse number 1. In a similar way, Christians see the song referring allegorically to Christ and His church and His great love for the church. After all, the church is called the bride of Christ. Matthew 9, verse number 15, John 3, verse 29, and Ephesians 5, and verse 23. There are certainly many allegories found within the Bible along with type and antitypes, and I see no real harm with making Song of Solomon take on these kinds of allegories. However, there are several reasons I do not believe that this is what is intended by the purpose of this book. Number one, it strains the text. The book is too physically intimate to assume that it depicts Christ and the church relationship. Even though Ephesians 5 verse 23 and following talks about the bride of Christ, this book is simply too much on the intimate side to mean this in my opinion. Number two, the book is never alluded to in the New Testament, let alone applied to the church. It just seems logical if it was talking about the relationship of Jesus and His church that at least one inspired writer would have referred to it as being such. Number three, works that are allegorical usually give some indication or hint that they are allegories. But the Song of Solomon gives no indication that an allegory is being made. The third approach to this book is the literal didactic moral view. Simply put, this means the Song of Solomon records a literal event, but at the same time teaches moral principles. This is why I believe that it was read at the Passover by the Jews because most women would be present at this feast. And it would be an excellent time to teach the husbands and wives how they should feel about one another in spite of their individual imperfections. This is the most logical view in my opinion, and it provides God's children with some direction about intimacy and marriage. Its purpose is to teach some very important principles about marriage and shows that sexual relations in marriage are not wrong because it is what God intended. Only sexual relations outside of marriage are condemned in the Bible. Walter notes, the book then was intended as a commentary on Genesis 2 verse 24 and a manual on the blessing and reward of intimate uh, married loved ones. Yahweh had lit the flame and given the capability of enjoyment. Also note what Carr said about this, a frequently Old Testament term for the sexual union of a man and a woman is the verb know. It is worthy to note that the most intimate knowledge of another person is not on the basis of intellectual exchange or the discussion of theological ideas, but in the intimate sexual union of male and female. In this slide, it should not be considered obscene that at least one book of the Bible be dedicated to the celebration of one of the central realities of our creaturehood. The song does celebrate the dignity and the purity of human love. This is a fact that has not always been sufficiently stressed. The song, therefore, is didactic and immoral in its purpose. It comes to us in this world of sin where lust and passion are on every hand, where fierce temptation assail us and try to turn us aside from the God-given standard of marriage. And it reminds us in particularly beautiful fashion how pure and noble true love is. I have no problem with you viewing the Song of Solomon as being an allegory. But what makes the most sense to me is that it is a literal event with moral principles taught about marriage and love between man and woman. This song tells us the story of King Solomon wooing and wedding a shepherdess. It gives us a beautiful yet straightforward description of marital love. It gives us both men and women great advice on how to treat each other and how to love each other. It also teaches the proper place for conjugal love as does the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 7 verse number 1. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. 
Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Hebrews 13 verse 4, Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. The book also teaches that the unwed are not to rush into an intimate relationship. In chapters 8 and verse number 4, it says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. While the world says, it's not a big deal, everybody does it. Well, God's Word teaches us to remain pure until the day we are wed. Since this is a more mature book, I'm not going to be going into every verse that there is. And in fact, I am going to limit the things that I'm going to say about this book that I could discuss in detail if I were only speaking to married folks. So I would suggest that you read the book on your own, learn from it, and let it rekindle the great love that you should have for each other. To help you get more out of your reading, I want you to note the following subjects that are being discussed in each chapter. Chapter 1, the bride's love for the king, mostly words of her own devotion, with brief replies by the king and chorus. Chapter 2, the bride's delight in the king's love, mostly her own words spoken to herself about the king's embraces. Chapters 3, verses 1 through 5, the bride's dream of her lover's disappearance and her joy of finding him again. Chapter 3, verses 6 through 11, the bridal procession greeting in the palace garden of the nuptial chariot and by the palace ladies. Chapter 4, the king adores his bride. She replies, inviting him to her garden of marital delights. Chapter 5, another dream of her lover's disappearance following their nuptial union and her devotion to him. Chapter 6, the Shulamite is recognized by the king and the 140 beauties of the palace as being the loveliest among them. Chapter 7, their mutual devotion told each to the other in a profusion of spring song metaphors. Chapter 8, the love unquenchable and their union indissoluble, words partly from bride and partly from the chorus. This is a great book for us to read. Not only does it remind us of the love that we ought to have for our spouse, it also teaches us the importance of choosing the right mate because we must understand that marriage is supposed to be for life. If we cannot see ourselves growing old with that person that we're going to marry, and we can't see them as someone that's going to help us stay focused on, on making sure that we make it to heaven, then don't get married. Before I close this lesson, I want to read some of our text that shows how Solomon poured his heart out about how he felt for his spouse. You know, it seems when we first start getting to know the woman we are going to marry, we spend a lot of time wooing her and telling her how special she is. But sometimes we lose sight of that as the years pass on and we begin to take her for granted. But I can promise you that your wife you know, she wants to be reminded of how much you love her. She wants to be reminded of how great she is in your life. And of course, the same thing could be said about the wives reminding uh, their husbands about the same thing. Well, this is not the kind of language that we would use today. I want you to notice how Solomon expresses his love to his spouse, starting in chapter 4, verse number 1. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep which have come up from the washing, every one of which bears twins and none is barren among them. Your lips are like a strand of scarlet and your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built for an armory, on which hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. 
You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amma, from the top of Sinir and Hermon, from the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopards. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one length of your necklace. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse. How much better than wine is your love and the scent of your perfumes than all spices. Your lips, O oh my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, fragrant henna, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and alloys, with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Now that's what the ladies would call being romantic. Guys are certainly wired differently than women, and their focus is not so much on words, but they still enjoy hearing pleasant things spoken to them from their wives. For example, notice what the Shulamite says about her beloved in chapter 5, starting at verse 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is carved ivory, inlaid with sapphires. His legs and pillars of marble set on the bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Let us learn from this intense love song that married couples need to keep the passion alive in their marriages. God has given us each other to enjoy the benefits of marriage both physically and spiritually. If you or someone else is in the process of choosing a mate, don't jump into marriage without seriously considering if you want to be with that person for the rest of your life. And consider if that person is going to be one that is going to help you to remain faithful to the Lord. So read the book and learn from it. Hope you found this lesson helpful. No matter what lesson I preach, I want you to test what I say or any person says about God's Word by comparing what is being said to the Bible. Don't ever be lazy in this area because it is too important to simply trust in what a man is saying because we are all human and we're capable of being wrong. One thing we know for sure is that God's Word will not lead us astray, so we can always trust in it. As Psalm 146.3 says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. Psalm 18, verse 30, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. I will always do my best to preach the truth, but I hope if you catch me teaching error that you will contact me so that we can discuss the matter. If you would like to learn more about LG Ministry and the congregation I preach at, feel free to visit our website at lgchurchofchrist.com. On our website, you will find a lot of material that can help you with your spiritual growth. On our main page, you will find an online correspondence course that you can take that will walk you through the basics. On our sermon page, you will find just about every sermon I've preached at my local congregation. You will also find some audio sermons and Bible class materials that you are free to study and use. On our article page, you will find tracts that you can read and print off and articles that have been written for our local paper. Finally, on our video page, you'll find our new video lessons like the one that you're watching now. I know we live in a fast-paced world 
where it seems like we don't have time to do much of anything. But I want to encourage you to find time out of each day to sit down and to study God's Word. Life is great and there's nothing wrong with being busy, but we must be careful that we don't get to the point where we get so busy that we fail to take time to feed ourselves spiritually from God's Word. We must remember that God is supposed to be our number one priority. If you find my lessons to be helpful, be sure and tell people about our program so that others can hear sound lessons from the Bible. I hope you have a blessed day.